I haven't changed this presentation. I did it two years ago when we were doing a sort of a consultation exercise on the pharmacist survey. It was something that I thought would be useful just to contribute to the story. Um, and it was just really looking at Kent in terms of something we all know about. We all know about the, the, the character of Kent. And so it's really just a quick, quick run through. Um, you know, my, my, my thoughts, which are obviously your thoughts as well. In terms of Kent's character, we have to look at the geology and it comes down to characterisation and, and the patterns that we've seen evolve through the farmsteads. Um, and obviously, you know, these are the technical terms in terms of the different geologies that we're, um, we're looking at. <coughs> when we look at pictorially, it's quite interesting, obviously, because you start to realise that geology and character are both going hand in hand in terms of chalk and, uh, you know, the... Um, sort of the London clays coming through to the weald and the, the, the clays down on the weald as well. And it's these that give us the geology that then goes into other studies that have been done. The, the most recent one is, is, is um, this one on the strategic stone study, which was looking at Kent's stone. It's less known about, obviously, you've got ragstone and the weald stones. Um, but there was a study that was carried out which started to map the character of the stones and uh, referring them back to historic buildings um, to try and get a, a, a grapple on, on where the quarries are that uh, you know, were used to build these ancient buildings and they were very local and it's another issue that in terms of minerals planning uh, planners are having to grapple with how do we find sources of local stone material for, you know, for repairing historic buildings so this, this strategic stone study was very useful in terms of, you know, setting out the pattern of what we've got uh, within Kent. Um, and obviously it's, it's a part of understanding, you know, our local building materials. I think Kent, as, as we see from these quotes from Alec Clifton Taylor in, in Pevsner, brilliant, you know, right at the beginning, talking about, you know, the fact that Kent is about its clay in terms of those tiles, the Kent pegs and the bricks. Uh, I think, again, if we keep that in mind, we're not going to go wrong in terms of how we actually deal with our context, um, you know, in, in, in most of Kent. And again, if you look at it in terms of bricks and tiles, we've got, up in North Kent, we've got the London clays, which are the lime-based clays. These are the clays that give us the light-coloured yellow bricks, the stocks. So a lot of our character there is going to be yellow stocks. And then you'll come down onto the weald and you get into where we are now, the heart of the weald, where we've got the reds, and it's those reds that we really characterise Kent with, the red clays and the red bricks. But then you've also got this band through the middle, which is the gold clays. And it's quite interesting to see a barn that's got a bit of a mix of gold clay coming through in the barn. Quite nice to see that. Um, and obviously then we've got uh, through the middle, we've got the green sandstone, the ragstone, which is again something that goes from west to east. And again, if you look at it in terms of character, we've got that same layering. And again, it's obvious really, isn't it? It's part of our geology, <coughs> so why wouldn't we expect to see that? So then you get into visioning. And being an architect, that's what I like looking at. I like to see what it is that uh, we're looking at in terms of Kent. Steep pitched roofs, originally maybe thatched, now clay tiled. You know, these, these, these elements, again, the red brick and the stone or the timber, you know, are going to form the basis for a lot of the palettes of what we're going to be looking at trying to, to, to reinstate. Again, it's just a quote from Alec Clifton Taylor in his um, Buildings of England, Kent. You know, yeah, no, no, you know, it's, it's, this, this, is, this is for me, this is Kent, you know, I've, I've worked in the East Midlands, but here, this is, this is what we're talking about, you know, the actual beauty of, of what we've got here with the clay. And again, this is in Cranbrook, just like the road, tile hanging, again, very distinctive character for this part of Kent. But then obviously the, the way we, we went on to, to, to adopt certain technical um, ways of getting around tax, we ended up with mathematical tiles. You know, we're cunning, we were. You know, we worked out how to actually get around not paying tax on bricks, in. So, so we ended up with tiles. It's always a loophole to find. Here's some buildings, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you know, most of us wouldn't know that that's, that's a timber frame building. 
It's been uh, covered with mathematical tiles. Very clever. Um, and as I said earlier on, you know, in terms of our stone, um, actually moving through the bands to the east to the west, um, those, those alternating um, uh, layers of, of clay and, uh, and stone are what distinguish our, our, our stone buildings. Then building stone, this is out of the um, stone, stone uh, survey, looking at the bedrock geology. And again, what a fantastic array of, 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 of stone architecture we have. And again, this comes obviously into our, our, our rural context, you know, where we're, we're actually looking at local materials around the area. I think, I think once, once you've, you've started to understand your, your pattern, you know, the pattern language that we have. And, and one of the brilliant things about this farmstead guidance, it's the final piece in the jigsaw. We've all understood materials, we all appreciate what good quality materials can do for a development, but actually understanding how a building sits in the landscape and understanding the character of that landscape and, and, and looking at it from a distance, <coughs> Appreciating that there is a subtlety in the patterns, and I can remember with Jeremy when we, we actually went out onto the North Kent Downs four or five years ago and looked out, and the first thing we said was, what is that pattern? And I remember Jeremy saying, well, it looks like a dispersed settlement, you know, and I, I thought, well, it, yeah, it, it makes sense, but how, how, how much variety is there across Kent? And what we were able to, to, to now do with the work that Bob's done in terms of mapping all these farmsteads is to be able to tell what character of farmstead we're looking at within an area. So when you come along to talk to a planning officer, you should now be able to say, well, we have the, the basic um, evidence to, to be able to show exactly what pattern we've got, what's missing from it, and what would be appropriate to reinstate in order to keep that character and form within the landscape. And having the confidence to, to, to know that that's based on, on, on good evidence um, is going to help everyone, I think. It's going to help the decision makers and those coming forward, you know, looking for sympathetic change in the landscape. <coughs> so, you know, actually having that staged approach, being able to look through, through the different areas, and to be able to look at the different forms of building and the materials and to be able to then see a system of how you can go through and analyse and, and develop your proposals based on looking at these, these different patterns of, of, of farmstead that we have. We then get to a stage where we can, we can feel comfortable about what we're going to reinstate and what we're going to remove. And again, these, these illustrations I think are just so useful in terms of just quickly understanding the, the different building forms that we're looking at. So, I think, uh, again, these are indicative. They show the type of forms that we would expect to see in the landscape. And I think, again, it gives confidence to the decision makers to know that if if this has been, you know, considered by an applicant, you know, someone coming forward with a scheme, then it starts to make sense of the pattern of, of what we're looking at in, in, in Kent's landscape. I just threw this one in in terms of design to show how even modern design can be quite, you know, quirky. It can add some interest. I mean, this one's obviously just talking about, you know, the silhouette and reflecting an existing building. It's a contemporary approach. It's obviously going to be using materials that are traditional. Um, we had a bit of a discussion in our corner here about modern industrial materials against using traditional materials. I think obviously people feel more comfortable in terms of seeing you know, a, a traditional material used. Um, but obviously it's going to depend very much on the architect that you're working with and how comfortable you feel. 
and then being able to convince, obviously, the decision makers that that's the right approach. Again, this is a more modernistic approach. Tinkwood looking, it's a courtyard, it's fairly low key, so there's potential for, for something like that to see it succeed, as long as it is, isn't adversely impacting on the setting within the landscape. And again, I think it's this idea of not getting too closely involved, always being able to stand back and actually see what it is that you're you're doing, you know, what impression you're making, you know, within the wider context. And finally, I'd say, don't forget, you know, we, we in Kent, we, although we have our local materials, they're, they're a diminishing resource. They're getting less used. Um, as, as a result, we're losing brick manufacturers, which is crazy. You know, we're, we're, we're Kent, you know, we're, we're about bricks and tiles. And yet we've only got a small handful of, of people still manufacturing. And so I think uh, if you have an opportunity, do try and use your local suppliers, you know, in terms of the materials that, that, that are available. Gallagher's now, they, they want an appeal to, to extend the quarry, that's Hermitage Lane, um, but part of that condition for winning was that they have to produce a quantity of ragstone. So for the first time ever, we actually have a, a saw at the quarry cutting ragstone for building works. So stone suppliers aren't having to hulk off tons of, of ragstone to, to, um, to cut and then find that they've got huge amounts of wastage. It's being cut to, to, to slabs available for people to, to take, take away from the site and cut form, which is, which is a, a really good thing to have. And that's it. I kept it short and sweet. Thank you very much.